Greetings, chess players. My name is Chris Torres, and this is Daily Chess Musings special coverage of the 2021 FIDE World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nipom Nishi. Because of the historic importance and lengthy nature of Game 6, I broke this round into three videos. Tonight, we are examining Part 3 of Game 6 from the 2021 FIDE World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nipomnishi. In our third and final installment for Game 6, we will witness Magnus squeezing blood out of stone in the form of pressing for a win against Napo in an ultra-complicated endgame that was objectively evaluated as a draw in computer table bases. In order to triumph, Carlsen disregards the famous endgame wisdom of placing a rook behind pass pawns and, in fact, placed his rook in front of his pass pawns in order to press the white pieces forward. Doing so meant that Nipom Nishi needed to play like a computer to draw, and under the circumstances, playing with 100% precision over scores of moves against Magnus was just too tall a task for Nepo or any other chess player alive today. Game 6 of the Carlsen Nipom Nishi match will probably go down as Magnus Carlsen's greatest endgame so far, and undoubtedly the greatest endgame triumph ever in a world championship match. In total, it took Magnus Carlsen 136 moves and 7 hours and 45 minutes, setting the all-time record for the longest game in the history of the World Chess Championship in order to defeat Jan Nipom Nishi and take the lead in the 2021 FIDE World Championship match. So, without further ado, let's examine the thrilling conclusion to Game 6 of the 2021 FIDE World Championship match. In the exciting conclusion of Part 2 in our series, featuring Game 6 from the 2021 FIDE World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nipomnishi, we saw Magnus exchange down into a rook and knight and three pawns versus queen and two pawns endgame, beginning with move 80, rook takes f7, king takes f7, rook b7 check, king g6, and then rook takes a7. So we will begin part three by looking at black's 82nd move, which is queen d5. After the last couple of exchanges, the position is still even, but very, very unusual. Magnus has a rook and knight plus three pawns versus Jan's queen and pawn. It's worth noting that white is the only side playing for a win here, as black has no passed pawns. However, in complicated and imbalanced endgames, there is a greater chance for a decisive result. The human factor needs to be added to the equation, with both players having already been at this game for seven hours. Their chances of losing a world championship match game with one miscalculation is very real. 83 Rook A6 check. Magnus is really the only player with a reason to play for a win because of his past pawns. However, advancing those past pawns without allowing the Black Queen a forking opportunity or to initiate a perpetual check will be very challenging. 83 King H7, 84 Rook A1, 84 King G6. Jan is waiting to see what Magnus has in store. 85 Knight D4. Then 85, queen b7. 86, rook a2. Stopping the check from queen b2. So Jan plays 86, queen h1. Threatening queen h2 check or possibly h4. Exchanging pawns and exposing white's king. 87, rook a6 check. But Magnus checks first. And he will be giving Jan lots of checks, which are also opportunities for black to go wrong. 87, king f7. 88, knight f3. Guarding h2 from black's queen. 88, queen b1. Jan is handling the pressure beautifully and once again prepares to check white's king from the queen side. 
89 rook d6. Now if black's queen checks from the second rank, white can interpose with rook to d2. So Jan plays 89 king g7. Magnus plays 90 rook to d5. 90 queen a2 check. 91 rook d2 as expected. 91 queen b1. And Magnus plays 92 rook e2. Perhaps from e2, Carlson's rook can support white's e-pawn advancing. 92, queen b6. So Jan immediately pins the pawn on e3 to white's king, stopping it from advancing. 93, rook c2. So Magnus must go back to the drawing board to find a way to coordinate his pieces in such a manner that his past pawns can advance. Again, he must do so without allowing Jan a material gaining tactic or perpetual check. 93 queen b1, 94 knight d4, and then 94 queen h1. Again, targeting h2 with a check or possibly pawn to h4, opening up white's king. 95 rook c7 check. Carlson again checks Jan before Jan can play queen h2. Black's king goes to f6. 96 rook c6. All of these checks offer black opportunities to err. 96 king f7. Carlson plays 97 knight f3. Again, guarding h2 from black's queen. So Jan plays 97 queen b1. Again, threatening to play queen b2 check. Carlson plays 98 knight g5 check. Then Jan responds with 98 king g7. Handling the pressure beautifully, not making mistakes. 99 knight e6 check, and then 99 king f7. Magnus plays 100 knight to d4. So if black's queen goes to the second rank to say check, Magnus's rook can once again interpose. So Jan returns his queen to h1, threatening queen h2 check. Move 101, rook c7 check. Magnus is once again checking Jan's king with his rook before Jan can play queen h2 check. Black's 101st move is king f6. On move 102, Magnus returns his knight to f3, once again guarding h2. And then 102, queen b1. Jan is once again eyeing queen b2 check. Carlson plays 103, rook d7, again preparing to block queen b2 check with rook d2. So after 20 moves in the rook and knight versus queen endgame, Magnus has made no progress. 103, queen b2 check. And then Magnus plays, as expected, 104, rook d2. And then 104, queen b1. 105 knight g1. Ironically, it turns out that sending the knight home was the only way to move forward. 105 queen to b4, threatening white's rook, to which Magnus responds 106 rook d1, and Jan plays 106 queen b3, threatening the rook again. 107 rook d6, check, and Jan plays move 107 king g7, Magnus plays move 108, rook to d4. Then 108, queen b2 check. And white's 109th move is knight e2. Finally, Carlson finds a structure from which he can advance the e-pawn. Meaning here, white's knight shields black's queen from check. And if the black queen went to b6, white's rook shields the e3 pawn from being pinned. So Jan took a little extra time on move 109 and came up with queen to b1. Move 110 for white is pawn to e4. Not a huge improvement for white, but Carlson finally makes progress inching closer to victory. Move 110, queen h1. Jan again is threatening queen h2 check or h4. After g takes h4, queen takes h4 check, exposing white's king. However, this plan is a little inaccurate now that white's pawn has advanced to e4. 
A more precise move for Jan would have been 110, King F7, placing his king in a path to bl blockade White's passed pawns. Then play could continue 111 e5, king g6, rook c4, queen b6 check, king f3, queen b3 check, rook c3, queen b6, rook e3, queen c6 check, king f2, and 116 queen e6 would stop white from advancing his pawns. But black would obviously need to be careful not to allow white's rook to go to d6 while black's king and queen are on the same rank. But in the heat of battle, Jan missed this defensive posture and instead played a close second best of move 110, queen h1. Move 111, rook d7, check. Again, Carlson plays a rook check before Jan can play a queen check. 111, king g8. Move 112 for white is rook d4. Queen h2, check. Then 113, king e3. And here Jan played move 113, h4. So he finally gets his opportunity to open lines of attack on white's king from both sides. Carlson plays 114, gx, h4. Then Jan plays queen h3, check. 115, king d2. And Jan plays 115, queen takes h4. I checked this in my correspondence chess endgame table bases, and this is, with 100% accuracy, a drawn position. But this is not a correspondence chess match where table bases are allowed. This is a world championship match where Jan Nepomnishi is in the hot seat. Carlsen plays move 116, rook d3, and Jan moves his king to f8, move 117, rook f3, followed by queen d8 check, move 118, king e3, followed by queen a5. Carlsen plays 119, king f2, because if he's going to advance any more up the board, his king will need to do so on the side of the board where black's queen has less open space for checking. And on cue, Jan plays move 119, queen a7 check. Magnus blocks the check with move 120, rook e3. Jan plays queen d7. And Magnus plays 121, knight g3. Jan plays queen d2 check. 122 king f3. Queen d1 check. 123 rook e2. White's pieces are doing a good job blocking checks. Jan plays move 123 queen b3 check. Magnus plays 124 king g2. Move 124 black queen b7. Jan pins the e4 pawn to the king to prevent its further advancement. Magnus plays 125 rook d2. Every club level player knows that rooks belong behind pass pawns. So why is Magnus placing his rook into the d-file? Answer, the best chess player in the world wants his rook on d5, interfering with black's pin. Knowing that the pin won't work in a moment, Jan plays 125 queen b3. White's 126th move is rook d5, an exceptional exception to the rule of rooks belong behind pass pawns. Jan responds with 126, king e7, placing his king in the path of the e pawn. White plays move 127, rook e5, check. So Carlson's rook politely asks the king to move out of the way. Jan plays king f7. Perhaps confused by his opponent's odd use of his rook, Jan makes an inaccuracy. Slightly better here was stepping out of check with king d6. Play would continue rook f5, queen e3, king to h3. King gets back into the e-file with king e7. Move 130, king g4. Queen g1, pinning the knight to the king. Rook e5, check. King f7. Rook h5, queen d1 check, king h3, king e8, staying in the e-file. Rook e5 check, king f7, 
Rook d5, queen g1. Move 136, rook f5 check, followed by king e6. Would have been Jan's best chance at holding on to the draw. However, in our feature game, Jan stepped out of check by playing move 127, king f7. And that is slightly inaccurate. Magnus plays move 128, rook f5 check. He certainly could have also started moving his king forward with, say, king h3, queen f3, rook g5, queen e3. Move 130, rook g4, queen b6. Knight f5, king f6, rook g5, queen f2, knight g3, king f7, king g4, queen g2. Rook f5, check, king e8. e5, queen f2, rook f6. Setting up this neat structure where white's e5 pawn defends the rook on f6, which defends white's pawn on f4, which in turn defends the pawn on e5, freeing up white's king's ability to move forward and giving the knight the opportunity to shield the king from checks. However, in our feature game, Magnus played move 128, rook f5 check, to which Jan responded with 128, king e8, and then move 129, e5. Now Magnus can place his rook onto f6, where again it'll be defended by the pawn on e5, and from which his rook will be able to defend the backward pawn on f4. Thus the two pawns in the rook can be self-sustaining while Magnus attempts to bring his king up the board, shielded from checks when necessary, by his knight. It's an ingenious solution to a seemingly impossible problem. And I am simply amazed that even Magnus Carlsen came up with this over the board. Jan plays move 129, queen a2 check, 130, king h3. And then black's 130th move is queen e6, pinning white's rook to the king. So Magnus plays 131, king h4, advancing his king and stepping out of the pin. And Jan plays 131, queen h6, check. Well, there's something to be said about bringing the queen back to a2, where it can harass white's king from h2. So let's take a look at it. So, if Jan had played 131, queen a2, Carlson could play move 132, knight h5, allowing queen h2 check, knowing that he could play king g5. Then if queen g2 check, white's king can go to f6, queen to b7, Knight to g7 check, king f8. Knight to e6 check, king e8. But white's king goes back to g5 so it can get to h6. You'll see why in a moment. Queen g2 check, king h6, queen h3, king g6, queen g2, king h7, queen h3, king g8. Where it looks like white's rook is hanging for black's queen, but of course, if queen takes f5, then knight g7 is a check and a game-winning fork. So instead of queen takes f5, black could play king e7, but then white can play rook f6. And here we have this really nice sustaining structure again, which is a key to Carlson's winning endgame strategy. Queen g4 check, king h7. Queen h5 check, king g7. Queen g4 check, king h6. Queen h3 check, king g6. Queen g2 check. And now the knight can block with g5. 147, king d7. 148, f5. King e8. 149, rook b6. King to d7. e6 check, king c7. Rook to b4, king d6. Rook to d4 check, king c7. And now Magnus's rook finally gets behind the passed pawn. Queen a2, f6, queen d5, e7, queen g8 check, king h6, queen h8 check, knight h7, queen g8, and then e8 equals queen. And of course, white would win from here. So had Jan 
brought his queen back to the second rank with 131 queen a2 magnus could have continued up the board with that same innovative rook and pawn structure and then when his pawns got to the sixth rank placed his rook behind the passed e pawn to win the game interesting end game technique and I think in the future I will uh, revisit this uh, particular endgame in excruciating detail. But for right now, I'm happy to summarize the main themes so as not to turn off the majority of my YouTube subscribers. However, if you want to see more details about this endgame, you can visit dailychessmusings.com to see my extensive notes to Game 6 of the FIDE World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nepomnishi. Back to our feature game where Jan Nepomnishi has just played move 131, Queen H6 check. Magnus's knight again shields the king with 132, Knight H5. Jan plays Queen H7, keeping the pin on the knight. Magnus plays 133, E6, which sets up Rook F7, threatening Black's queen, followed soon after by Knight G7 check. So Jan plays 133, Queen G6. And of course, it's worth noting that had Jan played Queen takes F5, then of course, Magnus had Knight G7 check and Fork winning the game. Which is why Jan played move 133, queen g6. Magnus plays move 134, rook f7, as expected. Because had he played queen takes e6 check, you've got knight g7 check, and there's that fork again. But it gets a little bit more fun than that, because the black king could collect white's rook. White's knight could take the queen. Then the king could take the knight, but Magnus would have king g5, to which Jan could get back into the file of the pawn with king f7. But then, of course, king f5 is opposition. And let me just expand on that thought with a mini lesson in opposition featured in every endgame book. If it's white to play in this position, it is a draw. But because it is black to play, white wins. For example, king g8. King g6, king f8, f5, king e7, f6, check, king e8, king g7. And white's pawn can safely advance and promote into a queen. That entire sequence is so profoundly educational, it's worth looking at again. So, again, if Jan had played queen takes e6, then knight g7 is a check and a fork, king takes f7. Knight takes queen, king takes knight, white's king advances to g5, black's king can get into the file of the pawn, but then white gets opposition, it's black's move, black's king must move somewhere, doesn't matter where, they're gonna lose. King g6, check, and there's nothing black can do to stop the pawn from promoting. Which is why Jan Nepomnishi played move 134 king d8 to which carlson played 135 f5 and we see this self-sustaining structure one last time so unique and so brilliant it's just awe inspiring that magnus carlson came up with this technique to make the seemingly impossible advancements of his past pawns possible Jan played 135, queen g1. And then the final move of the game was Magnus's 136, knight g7. Jan Nepomnishi resigned. And he resigns because he's seen enough. Magnus is going to win. And has proven to the world that he is the best endgame player a lot today. The Capablanca of our generation. But for those of us who are not super grandmasters, let's see what would have happened had play continued. Jan could have played queen h1 check, but Magnus's king would have a neat path to escape from the checking queen. King g5, queen g2, king h5, queen h2, king g6, queen g3 check, king h7, queen e5, king g8, and Magnus's king is shielded by his pieces. Queen b5, so then the pawns can move forward. F6, king c8, e7, 
king d7, e8 equals queen check, king d6. Many here would take the free queen on b5, but that's not as forcing as. Queen to e6 check, king c5, rook to c7 check, king b4, f7 because promoting to a second queen is actually the fastest way to mate. Black can survive the longest with king a3, f8 equals queen number two check. King b2, queen f2 check, king a3, queen f to a2 check, king b4, rook to c4 check, queen takes c4, and then queen e x c4 check mate. And at this level, there was no doubt that after move 136, Magnus Carlsen was going to win in a similar fashion. So Jan Nipomnishi understandably resigned here. I hope you enjoyed today's special presentation of Game 6 from the 2021 FIDE World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Jan Nipomnishi. For more on the match, please visit the official website at fideworldchampionship.com. Additionally, please take a moment to like this video and subscribe to my Daily Chess Musings YouTube channel. Finally, be sure to check out dailychessmusings.com to find my notes to this video, as well as thousands of other free learning resources. My name is Chris Torres, and I will see you next time with Game 7 from the Carlson-Nipomnichi match.